All righty. Well, earlier we talked about former talk show host Wendy Williams speaking out for the first time following the news of her diagnosis of primary progressive aphasia and frontal temporal dementia. But the two part lifetime docu documentary, Where is Wendy Williams, also aired over the weekend, giving a look inside her current state. And many fans had a chance to witness just how this uh, disease is affecting her. Licensed gerontologist Dr. Macy Smith joins us today to help us understand and recognize the signs. She's going to give us a full breakdown um, so that if we recognize these signs in our loved ones, what we should do, if, especially if we suspect something is off. Um, now, we talked a little bit. You gave us some tips. You said, now, mm -hmm. according to the Alzheimer's Association, frontal, uh, frontotemporal dementia is rare and typically a care, uh, occurs at a younger age uh, and affecting people between the ages of 45 and 60 years old, mm -hmm. that really shocked me. Yeah, it's it's considered early onset because you typically think of dementia as an older person's disease right. over the age of 65, but we're looking at over 200,000 Americans. They're diagnosed with early onset of a progressive type of dementia. And that type of dementia typically goes a lot faster than mm. if you're diagnosed at a later age due to other comorbid conditions or co-occurring conditions. In Wendy Williams' situation, you know, she's talked transparently about her thyroid disease, also her lymphedema, Graves' disease, and she also talks openly about her substance abuse yeah. with alcoholism. There is an alcohol-induced dementia as well. There are over 100 causes of dementia. Dementia is the umbrella term. It comes with uh, behaviors that come with uh, memory loss, agitation, forgetfulness, um, inability to make judgment, and it also affects language and speech. Mm. When it comes to frontal temporal, you think about the frontal lobe, yeah. which is behind the forehead, that manages uh, uh, emotions, it manages judgment, it also manages language. When we talk about the temporal lobe, which is behind the eardrum, it manages understanding that language, behavior, and memory. And so frontal temporal is typically a medley of unexplainable brain diseases that destroy the brain cells in those areas. And so now you can understand why someone lashes out or they're irritable mm. or they forget or they get upset when they think you forgetting because yeah. they're trying to make sense of the world world around them at the time and they're doing the best they can with what they have because their brain is literally deteriorating. Right. And you actually had an opportunity to watch the docuseries over the weekend. You watched both parts. Yeah. It, it was actually four parts. Four parts. At, yeah. First, first part, three total. And I knew it was going to be heart wrenching, but I forced myself to watch it because I've been following her story for well over a year because it was getting me really frustrated a year ago when people were, you know, casting all types of aspersions on her when clearly for someone who is uh, in tune to this area, it was some form of dementia happening and it wasn't anything that she could help. I think mm. people don't realize how much lifestyle choices play a part in your overall brain health. Right. What we know about dementia now, Sierra, is that a third of the dementias that we see could possibly be prevented with lifestyle changes. Mm -hmm. What you choose to put in your body, where you choose to live and who you choose to be around, how you manage stress, how you manage those core occurring conditions such as high blood pressure. Um, and so when we think about the choices that we make, we always talk about and we think about overall health and our heart health, we gotta think about brain health as well. Now, I, I remember seeing some stories of uh, one of Wendy's former representatives, I think it was a lawyer or someone to that effect, saying that she noticed that her, her condition differed depending on who she was with and that she seemed to be better when she was with her son. And you mentioned environments and, and things that we put in our bodies. So would you consider maybe the environment being one of those factors for Wendy as well? You know, her showing signs of her signs not being so extreme when she's around her loved ones versus right. other people. So I'll tell you, whenever somebody else sees the signs or symptoms, we know that the earlier symptoms occur 15 to 20 years before diagnosis. Mm. And so what tends to happen is when they're around familiar places and they're around places that are comforting, that, mm. are, that are loving, they tend to do well with any type of dementia, which is so concerning for me. Uh, Sierra, I don't even know if you know this, but I'm a court-appointed guardian and a guardian ad litem. So I had concerns about the fact that uh, her son or certain family members were not considered or, you know, to be the guardian in that case, but it's probably a whole bunch of moving parts. But um, 
when someone has a progressive type of dementia, the environment is very, very important. It has to be familiar. Um, the environment has to be situated in a way where the person can continue to do things that they are comfortable doing, that they enjoy right. doing, because it helps our psyche. It helps all of our psyche. So someone who has dementia, they still have a brain. They still can live well, but people around them, they need to better understand the disease, the symptoms of the disease, and how to manage the care. Absolutely, and you provided us with some person-centered care tips. Yeah. The one that you're mentioning right now we're talking about is creating a village and, and that, that familiarity. Talk yeah. about that. So you want to create a village as a caregiver because when you're caring for someone who's going to have personality changes, um, inability to manage emotions, inability to um, uh, make proper judgment, and the ability to communicate well, it's going to weigh on your psyche as a caregiver, as a family member, as a person. Mm -hmm. And so you want to be able to have the rescue. You want to be able to bring people in and switch out shifts. That includes the natural um, supports, family and friends, but also paid supports, people who are trained in dementia competent practices. I'm not talking about the person that's been working for somebody who has dementia for 45 years right. because they may not have been trained. So right. you want trained folks in there. And then again, you want to keep that um, environment simple, calming, comforting, loving, and then Sierra, you also want to ensure that that person, you know, um, has the opportunity to participate in their long-term care, mm. being able to get those end-of-life care documents in place to whereas they can be a part of that decision-making because the last thing you want to happen is have a court assign yeah. and appoint a guardian. Uh, we're going to get the next full screen, what you should do. So you, you mentioned uh, uh, connecting with a uh, specialist mm -hmm. and also starting to plan some of that long-term uh, care with an attorney. Right. And I'll say this, too. If someone is living with frontal temporal dementia, families and the person who's living with the condition, you need to contact the Association for Frontal temporal degeneration. So that way you can get connected to support groups of people who are experiencing the same things you're mm. experiencing. The Alzheimer's Association also has some great resources, but at, but you want to connect with folks who are considering and who are going through what you're going mm. through. And then you want to reach out to an attorney, uh, preferably an elder care attorney to start planning for those that long-term care because it can be very expensive. Mm. And then you want to understand the person's rights. And the person wants to understand their rights. As they begin to lose cognition, there are going to be moments where they're not going to be able to make decisions and so you want to be sure that those documents are in place while they still can. Absolutely. Well, Dr. Macy, thank you so much for joining us, sharing these amazing, amazing details. And if you all cannot tell by her voice, she is very, very passionate um, about these types of things. So we are so glad to be able to have you to come on to kind of break things down for us and explain these things to us. We're going to make sure to include some of the links to some of the resources doc, uh, that Dr. Macy has provided with us. They'll be on our website later on today, SodaCityLive.com. But we're going to take a quick break. And when we come back, we're going to talk about an amazing event that's going to be benefiting youth right here in our community. The seventh annual silent auction entitled Silently Speaking Success. We'll be right back after this.